so i think now we are live on facebook good evening everybody and welcome to today's session from love of the ocean to love from fear of the ocean to love of it an early triangle of uh, arabs asians and africans and to deliver this lecture this very interesting lecture we have professor mahmood kuria joining us from the leiden in the netherlands he's he's generally considered as one of the most reputed historians from kerala and professor kuria is an assistant professor at the history department of ashoka university and at present he is affiliated with the leiden university the netherlands earlier he was a research fellow at the international institute for asian studies african studies center leiden and the dutch institute in morocco he did his phd at the leiden university institute for history on the circulation of islamic legal ideas and text texts across the indian ocean and mediterranean worlds with michael n pearson he has edited malabar in the indian ocean world cosmopolitanism in a maritime historical region which was published by the oxford university press in 2018 his research specializations are pre modern indian ocean uh, afro afro asian connections matrilineal muslims and the islamic legal history and the areas of course of border research interest includes the pre modern interactions between abrahamical and indic reg- uh, religions global mobility of law and islamic intellectual history so without further ado i would request professor kuria to uh, begin with the presentation and we'll have some questions answered from the audience towards the end so uh, those who are listening to us live can feel free to send their questions through the facebook live chat thank you so much professor kuria for accepting our invitation and over to you uh thank you ishan for the introduction and also for uh, uh having me in the uh, in the series i've been following some of your uh, lectures and uh, ishan had be, had contacted me last year uh, to deliver this lecture uh, i think in june or so but i couldn't uh, make it last year but i am happy that now uh, we got the opportunity to uh, share some of my research through this platform so what i'm today uh, going to talk uh, is sort of you know an area of my research that i have been dealing with for some time uh although i didn't manage to explore uh, explore it earlier it was part of uh, you know while i was doing my phd dissertation uh that was submitted in leiden in 2016 which uh, basically was on the history of islamic law in the indian ocean uh, area in the ocean region i'll come to these details later but it was mainly looking at uh, the one school of law called shafi uh, school of law Uh, and how that uh, school and how its texts uh, sort of you know circulated across the indian ocean and to give a short example is that from south africa or like you know from cape town to southeast asia uh, even uh, in philippines or even further people mostly in the coastal areas have been following muslims in these coastal areas have been most following shafi uh, school of law at least uh, today we know that uh in contrast to for example let's say the predominant uh, muslim uh, community in south asia uh, whether it's in pakistan india or uh, bangladesh they all follow uh, majority of them follow uh, hanafi uh, school of islamic law uh, so but in the coastal areas uh, whether in konkan coast or malabar coast or coromandel coast many muslims uh follow uh and also in sri lanka malaysia indonesia uh you know tanzania and so forth somalia they all follow uh, shafi school of law so in my phd i was trying to look at how and why this a particular school became a trend in the indian ocean so that is mostly a sort of a study uh, in the i would say uh, in the second millennium of common era that is from 11th and 12th century uh, onward and i sort of go up to 19th century by looking at one text a uh, story of one legal text and how that text sort of you know influenced the circulation of islamic law uh, or more specifically shafi law in the indian ocean 
So this is sort of a, uh, I would say, prequel to that. What I will be talking about is uh, the early history of Islam and Islamic law in the Indian Ocean uh, from 7th century to 10th century. And this is somewhat a neglected area uh, of the research. So in order to, like before going to the details, I have uh, a PowerPoint that I'll share with you so that you know some of these uh, strange terms might be easy for most of you to follow. Yeah, I believe this is visible to you. Is it Ishan? I believe so. Uh, anyway, so uh, largely uh, Indian Ocean or the study of Indian Ocean itself has developed as a, as a rich field of you know, area in anthropology and history, geography and many, many fields. For students of history, uh, you know, this uh, area or Indian Ocean, uh, looking at uh, history of uh, humans, uh, from the perspective of ocean has been, you know, uh, an ongoing process, uh, at least from late, uh, sorry, from, yeah, late 1920s on what uh, scholars have been working on this area. Uh, and there are, you know, some of the stalwart historians such as, you know, K.M. Panikkar and uh, coming up to Ashin Das Gupta in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, who had written extensively on different aspects of, you know, uh, the interactions, human interactions with the oceanic spaces. But, uh, you know, by 1980s, uh, following uh, the French historian Fernand Brodel, many uh, scholars, mainly one uh, historian called Ken Chaudhary, uh, or Kirti and Chaudhary, who had, uh, you know, followed the French historian Fernand Brodel's uh, methodology to understand uh, the ocean or the human oceanic inter uh, interactions. He started, uh, so uh, Brodel himself, uh, you know, in his research, extensive research on the, the Mediterranean, he uh, argued how the uh, geographical structures have a long history compared to the political history or social history or economic history. And political history, to you know, uh, rephrase one of the uh, uh, one historian's uh, claim, uh, is that political history, for example, was the backbone of history for a long time. Uh, but uh, in the Annals school, uh, people like Brodel uh, claim that politi political history is sort of a mere event compared to the long history that the geographical structures, such as mountains and oceans, uh, have. So uh, brothers, uh, Brodel did this research or demonstrated the importance of the ocean by looking at the history of Mediterranean. And following that trend, uh, Ken Chowdhury, uh, you know, in 1985, he published this book on uh, Indian Ocean, basically following uh, the long history of the Indian Ocean. And, uh, uh, and ever since, uh, many more scholars have been, you know, working on Indian Ocean and then the interactions between Asia and Europe and you know different parts of uh, Africa uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, and so forth. And I would say it's sort of a reiteration of the company histories or the you know East India companies, whether the British East India Company or the Dutch East India Company, French East India Company, all sort of different European East India companies. And people looking at like, you know, the uh, histories of Portuguese in Asia or histories of Dutch uh, embers or the maritime embers in, in Asia and so forth. So in the notion sort of, you could say uh, was a important uh, framework for many of these uh, uh, historical investigations. I'm not naming any particular historians, but this was a major trend uh, in the Indian Ocean studies, particularly looking at the economic historical perspective. And in the last uh, 15, uh, 20 years, uh, even more scholars have been looking at uh, the same uh, geographical uh, realm framework from socio-cultural uh, frameworks. Scholars like, and I'm just naming a few, such as Anne Bang, Eng Sang Ho, Ronit Ritchie, and then Sabu Aslani, and all these people who, uh, all these scholars who looked at uh, particular communities who traveled between 
uh, different uh, areas in the Indian Ocean from Middle East to East Africa or from East Africa to Asia and so forth. So uh, these historians uh, utilize the frameworks of Indian Ocean as a, as a cultural uh, zone in which uh, people uh, moved across. So slightly moving away or even uh, not slightly, but moving away from the economic uh, histories or historic historiographies of early generation. And these are not an exhaustive list. There are many more scholars who had uh, worked along these lines in the last uh, 15, uh, yeah, almost 15 years. So, uh, and within that framework or within that uh, framework of Indian Ocean, the Abrahamic religions uh, or, you know, the uh, Abrahamic uh, religion by which I mean the uh, religious communities that claim a common ancestry from the, you know, prophet or forefather, you could say, uh, called Abraham, prophet Abraham. So Judaism, Christianity and Islam, they all sort of belong to the same lineage, uh, uh, at least like mythically if not historically. So all these uh, religions have uh, sort of, uh, were very influential in the Indian Ocean uh, from the first uh, millennium onward. Uh, so, and in the Indian Ocean, many of these communities, Indian Ocean literal, many of these communities have uh, established themselves in the second uh, century, uh, sorry, in the second millennium, it's of common era. And even though they claim that, you know, they have been there in these places in the first century of the origin of their religion itself. So not the first century of common era, but the first century of their religion. Uh, uh, so that is like, you know, for Christianity, of course, it would be the first century of common era, whereas for Islam, it would be the seventh century. So the communities in these places, uh, whether in Africa or whether in uh, Asia, they claim that, uh, you know, many of the, uh, communities or many of their ancestors or the presence of these religions have been there from the first century. And that's sort of a, a popular narrative, even though historically it is a bit, uh, you know, difficult to substantiate for many of these uh, communities. And uh, in the third and fourth centuries, uh, through the Roman trade networks in the Indian Ocean, uh, now we have the exchanges between Jewish and Christian communities, uh, you know, from Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean. And uh, in the African coast, particularly Judaism in Ethiopia and the, uh, and the uh, Christianity in Nubia, uh, these religions were prominent, uh, whereas in, in African, sorry, in Asian, coastal areas in the early centuries, at least in the third and fourth centuries, these religions were marginal, even though, we, uh, even though again, there are claims of the presence of these religions, even, even earlier. So what happens is that by the seventh century, uh, Islam comes, like, you know, Islam appears in the Arabian Peninsula, and then it, start, it sort of uh, starts to influence the uh, Indian uh, Ocean region. Uh, and Islam in the Indian Ocean, uh, something that, you know, uh, my uh, area of research focus uh, were, and it has been like, you know, in the Indian Ocean studies, uh, many scholars like, you know, starting from, you know, Ken Chaudhary that I just mentioned to the latest study, uh, latest book by Sanjay Subramanian came out uh, like last year. So th this is Ken Chaudhary's book, Trade and Civilization in the Indian Ocean. Uh, an economic history from the rise of Islam to uh, 1750. So uh, you see that like, you know, how Islam sort of becomes a, a important uh, role in his uh, framework itself. And this is the latest book that came out uh, last year uh, by Sanjay Supramanyam. He looks at uh, the early modern period that is 1500 to 1800. And he also looks at like, you know, both Islam and Christianity and how these different European, uh, not only European, uh, both Asian and European empires sort of negotiated uh, with, with, the, with, with these religions. So you see how Islam became, or Islam has been at the center of Indian Ocean historical uh, investigations. And uh, this has, or the importance of Islam in the Indian Ocean has motivated many historians to argue that uh, Indian Ocean in the pre-modern or, you know, in the medieval, like in a quote unquote medi medieval period was a, an Islamic lake, 
because of the prominent uh, or the prominence or the dominance of the uh, Arab Persian uh, merchants in the uh, in the trade and then uh, the mobility in the region. So you know, Islamic like is a term that is given to the Indian Ocean by scholars like Michael Pearson, Edward Alpers, and many other scholars also. And then they claim that uh, mainly in the 13th and uh, 13th to 15th centuries, just before the uh, uh, Europeans uh, appeared in the scenario in the 16th century, the Indian Ocean was uh, an Islamic like they argue. And uh, just before this, uh, Janet Abu Lugud, uh, one of the most uh, you know influential works that she wrote, uh, is called uh, Yeah, uh, Before European Hegemony, uh, uh, following Emmanuel Wallenstein's World System Theory. She follow. She argues that you know uh, by the 13th century, uh, Islam sort of became an important uh, realm or important catalyst in the Indian Ocean networks. Uh, you know, particularly after the collapse of the Abbasid Caliphate uh, in the Middle East in Baghdad. And this uh, in influence increased by even uh, or despite of the arrival of the European uh, companies, uh, uh, which sort of uh, tried to monopolize the Indian Ocean. So by 16th century, we witnessed the, you know, emergence of this uh, big and uh, small uh, Muslim polities, you know, the big polities such as the Safavids in Iran, Ottomans in uh, in Turkey, uh, not only in Turkey, in the Middle East, and then the Mughals. Uh, all these, uh, you know, major empires or dynasties uh, coming into the scenario in the 16th century, as well as many more in the coastal uh, uh, zones, in the maritime littoral, whether it's in Aceh or in, in the Malacca or in you know, in the Swahili coast, uh, the Adil Sultanate and so forth. So we have like, you know, the importance of Islam increasing by the 16th century. And this is something that many scholars have argued. But what we uh, lack in all these studies is that there is a gap, you could say, uh, a gap between seven to uh, 10 centuries. And this is uh, a question or also many scholars or some scholars at least like, you know, people like George Haurani and many others have argued that uh, among the Muslim communities, there was a thalassophobia or fear of ocean among the early communities. So in the seventh and eighth centuries, Muslims were afraid of ocean and then they didn't go to the uh, ocean, uh, you know, they're prohibited. And uh, there are evidences again, like, you know, doctrine, uh, if you look at the, you know, the scriptures of Islam, uh, where uh, scriptures as well as some historical evidences that many of them point out uh, that, you know, referring to the uh, supposed uh, or the hypo or the arguable thalassophobia. I, I believe you are familiar with the term thalassophobia, which is basically fear of ocean. Uh, so, uh, and once you, like, you know, uh, there is one interesting uh, hadith or the saying of the Prophet uh, in which the hadith, uh, in which the Prophet Muhammad says that, you know, there is fire below ocean and ocean below fire. And it is basically meaning that it is very dangerous to travel uh, in the ocean. And therefore, he, uh, in the hadith, he uh, prohibits that you know, people should not travel on the uh, ocean except for jihad, that is the holy war, and pilgrimage. Uh, so in the hadith particularly, he refers to the, the big pilgrimage, that is the hajj, as well as the minor pilgrimage, the umrah. So except for these three, that is the hajj, umrah, and then the jihad, uh, or the holy war, you should not travel on the ocean. So this becomes very important once we think of, for example, like, you know, the travel for trade, which was very important for the Indian Ocean community, Indian Ocean Muslim community. So uh, there is this sort of argument and this, you know, if you are interested uh, in this particular hadith, it comes from one of the early uh, classical texts of the hadith, Abu Dawood al sijistanis Sunan, you know. And then uh, similarly, there is another one, uh, by the second caliph, uh, Khalif uh, of Umar, sorry, 
Caliph of Islam uh, by Omar bin al-Khattab, who says he has a very interesting passage. So even though the Prophet himself agreed uh, or allo allocated the uh, uh, voyage or oceanic uh, uh, travels for jihad in a particular dictum uh, or in, a, in two letters at least, uh, uh, Khalif Umar uh, prohibited even the uh, journey or voyage for uh, war, jihad. So in, in one instance, one of his commander, uh, commanders uh, wrote to him, uh, if I remember uh, correctly, Amr ibn al-As, one of his commanders, uh, commanders who, who were about to, you know, he could, he wrote to him saying that he could hear the do uh, dogs bark uh, from the islands of Greece or the Greek islands. So, so you know, if the uh, Caliph gives him permission, he can basically cross the ocean and then conquer the Greek islands. And, uh, but uh, Umar said, you know, uh, he, Umar basically uh, prohibited it. And he said that, you know, you should not uh, travel across the sea because the safety of the, his people is more important uh, for him than conquering or, con uh, or than conquering a new land. So in this one, he basically says that undoubtedly the ocean is a great creature upon which weak creatures travel, so the humans travel. And it uh, it is like worms upon a pieces of wood. And this is, that is, you know, basically the translation of the word dudun ala ud, uh, similar to, you know, nurun ala nur. But in this one, dud uh, is not the Hindi dud for milk, but dud is worm and Ud is the wood. So he says that basically, you know, once humans travel on the ocean, it is uh, similar to worms uh, traveling upon a piece of wood. And therefore uh, he didn't give permission to his commander to, to uh, uh, cross the sea. And similarly, he also wrote a similar letter later on to uh, uh, another commander, uh, Mu'abiyah uh, bin Abu Sufyan, who also to whom also he said. So based on all these arguments, uh, you know, many, oh, may, based on some of these evidences, many scholars, early scholars have argued that basically there was a thalassophobia or fear of ocean among the Muslim community. And uh, this argument, uh, yeah, in case if you are interested in the particular reference, it comes from the, you know, Ibn Khaldun, one of the famous historians or sociologists uh, in his al muqaddimah uh, but also in the later references also you can find. So these arguments have been uh, questioned by uh, some of the latest studies. And this is uh, French historian Christophe Picard, his book uh, initially published in French, but recently, you know, at least two, three years ago, it was translated into English and published by Harvard University Press called The Sea of the Caliphs. And he uh, argues that many of the caliphs indeed did go to the ocean. And his work, uh, you know, is mainly focused on the uh, uh, Mediterranean uh, area. So we don't know much about the Indian Ocean for this time frame. And uh, one work, however, that came out, I think, last year by Hassan, uh, Hassan Khalili, uh, looking at the legal aspects of the sea uh, on the questions of piracy and freedom of uh, navigation and so forth. Uh, is uh, another study also that sort of questions this argument. And another one is by Dionysius Agius' work, uh, Classic Ships of Islam, basically looking at the navigation and the shipping technology uh, and so forth. So these sort of works uh, question some of these earlier uh, ideas of thalassophobia. And in all these uh, works, as I said, you know, uh, uh, so uh, Christophe Picard's, uh, Chris, uh, sorry, Christophe Picard's work looks at the Mediterranean. Hassan Khalilia mainly look at uh, the Indian Ocean, uh, sorry, uh, later periods, although he has one references or one uh, interesting discussions on the, uh, on the time of the prophet itself. And uh, uh, Agia's work uh, is mainly on the specific uh, navigation technology and ship making, ship building and so forth. So we don't know much about, you know, the communities and the people who actually travel between seventh and 10th century. And this is something that I would like to explore a uh, little bit. And we do have, you know, despite of all sort of different arguments against the, you know, doctrinal uh, or scriptural proscriptions 
against the oceanic voyage. We do have evidences of Muslims traveling across the ocean uh, for, during these centuries. So there are these uh, different migratory maritime communities and seasonal settlements. In th all these three places are in East Africa, uh, but you know, the uh, taking East Africa as an example, we could see that you know many evidences uh, where uh, people traveled, uh, you know, intermarried with local uh, populations, got acculturated, and also some of uh, local communities converting to the uh, to this new religion. And this is one uh, interesting uh, case uh, of a establishment of a mosque uh, in East Africa, in uh, in Shanga, uh, uh, you know, where Mark Horton, one of the prominent uh, uh, archaeologists of the region, you know, he gives this very interesting list of you know mosques, uh, at least uh, seven, eight mosques that were established in in just one island. Uh, group in 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 Shanga uh, in 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 the Swahili coast. So uh, here uh, in this chart, you can see uh, you know the uh, uh, radiocarbon datings of you know the uh, archaeological deposits as well as the uh, material evidences for the establishments of the mosques in the you know late seventh sorry yeah uh, from early uh, eighth century onward going up to twelfth century. And these are just a few examples, uh, but also there is this very famous case of, you know, a shipwreck that was found, uh, you know, uh, in, in Indonesia, Belitung shipwreck, uh, which is uh, a Dao, an Arab Dao that had traveled from uh, Africa to China in the ninth century and was, uh, you know, damaged and wrecked, uh, wrecked uh, in, in Belitung Sea. And this was, uh, you know, it had contained, uh, uh, I think, 60,000 of material objects uh, that were uh, being carried from China to the Middle East and possibly further to Africa. So, uh, you know, these are some of the uh, most well-known uh, examples uh, of the, you know, or the evidences of the Muslim uh, mobility in the Indian Ocean within the uh, first three centuries of Islam. And uh, in order to talk, like, you know, my interest is uh, specifically on the Islamic law, how these communities, once they settled in these places, how they might have practiced Islamic law in the, uh, in the uh, areas. In order to do so, I'll uh, briefly introduce the five major zones, uh, you know, that in which the uh, Muslims had settled uh, between uh, early 7th century to uh, 10th century. So these zones, the geographical zones, are not specifically looking at the contemporary, uh, you know, national boundaries. So there are these, the Arab uh, Persian uh, region, uh, or the Arab Persian zone, in which like the northern and eastern coast of the Red Sea is the important, along with many islands, such as the Socotra and Kuria Muria islands, and many more. Uh, up to the Makran coast uh, to the uh, in present day Pakistan. And then the African zone, which is the Western coast of the uh, Red Sea uh, going down to the Swahili coast. And you uh, pay attention to this wakwak, which is like, you know, a term that used in the Arabic, at that time in the Arabic geographical literature to refer to according to the contemporary arguments uh, to Madagascar. Uh, so all these places, like you know, not on uh, the coast and the islands, uh, is something that. Uh, and then uh, another area is the Indic zone. So mainly the Indian subcontinent, but also places of, you know, in Pakistan, uh, present-day Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and and the uh, fourth one is, sorry, Malay Malay region. Uh, so Southeast Asia, island Southeast Asia as well as the mainland uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and then uh, finally, the Chinese zone, the East Asian uh, zone, uh, which is like, you know, in the present, like now people identify it as part of the South China Sea, but also, you know, is part of the larger, uh, you know, oceanic engagements of the Muslim community. And here again, you see the same term, uh, walk, walk, which is uh, according to many 19th century and 20th century orientalists and other scholars, they argue that it is a term uh, used uh, for uh, Japan, 
so basically like you could see you could one could say you know the mobility of the muslim or the knowledge of the uh, people of the muslim uh, writers geographers travelers were between these two extremes japan and madagascar and the term wakwak basically is according to one historian chokat m thurava he says that it is a term for the geographical limit of your knowledge of the area uh, area at that time and it was not uh, specifically one uh, area or one country even though scholars have argued uh, others anyway so there are these five major zones in which the muslims were uh, prominent uh, like you know prominently uh, uh, settling and trading and you know engaging in different areas and uh, uh, so from the 7th century we have uh, 7 to 10th century we have several evidences on the migrations and settlements of uh, you know in these five zones and the arab arabian persian one i'll like leave it uh, because it's obvious that you know the uh, presence of muslims were uh, important in the arabian peninsula and then the persian uh, peninsula so the Afri the the remaining four on the african indic uh, chinese and malay i will mostly talk about them so the abyssinian voyage or the first uh, hijra or the migration of the muslims so i don't know whether you are familiar with the history of islam uh, where there is the uh, most famous hijra which is you know the early muslim community was migrated from mecca uh, to medina in order to escape the persecution of the uh, local quraish tribe so before that famous migration they had uh, indeed uh, migrated uh, to abyssinia which is you know uh, part of present day ethiopia and the east african area uh, in which like you know in the two batches muslims were muslims had migrated including uh, the daughter of the prophet uh, muhammad ruqayya and uh, the third caliph uh, the third would be caliph of islam uthman so they had migrated to uh, to abyssinia and this is one of the earliest evidences uh, that is validated in several uh, sources and one, uh, many of them did come back to uh, madina uh, to mecca and then eventually madina when the situations became more friendly to them but only after establishing a worship place and graveyard in the uh, in the uh, abyssinia and according to some historians early historians uh, some of them some of these early migrants had settled they didn't want to go back to arabia instead they settled in 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 the region and then they uh, you know continued to live there intermarried with the community and many muslims also uh, muslims in ethiopia and somalia region also claim that they are descendants of these early settlers from the region and interestingly at least one of them converted to christianity as well from islam to christianity so uh, similarly in the 7th century we are also from the indic and malay zones we have evidences for the strong arab presence especially on the chinese sources and uh, in the chinese sources uh, they they claim that the whole history of islam basically and the whole uh, history of prophet happened in the uh, in the java island uh, or in the javanese island so uh, it was something that prominent uh, you know the presence of muslims or the arabs in the area was that prominent uh, at least in the chinese sources and eventually once we come to uh, you know uh, the ming sources ming uh, mainly uh, for 15th 16th and 17th century we have a lot of uh, references uh, for example like you know uh, the uh, ming history the ming official history the ming yi tong shi Uh, as well as the you know uh, from the indian subcontinent and then you know uh, the east african uh, areas where you know people argue that uh, or many of these accounts uh, later uh, historical accounts argue that islam had arrived in these places uh, in the 7th century itself so but these claims are you know we cannot take them uh, for their you know at their face value because uh, all these uh, records are written in the uh, later period even though they claim you know their authenticity and originality for the 7th century so uh, 
but then despite of that we do have uh, several other uh, evidences for seventh century and then once we come to eighth century uh, we have this uh, famous political conquest of sindh you know the indian part of the indian subcontinent uh, by uh, muhammad bin qasim in 712 you might know and immediately after that uh, the dahilak archipelago in the uh, red sea area or closer to the african Uh, zone or part of the African zone was conquered by Suleiman bin uh, Abdul Malik, if I remember correctly, immediately after the conquest of Sindh. So this is happening in the eighth century, where the expansion of Islam or political expansion of Islam becomes more evident. And in the context of China, at least we have two very interesting uh, episodes in which you know, in one case, the Arabs and Persians raided the uh, port of Guangzhou. uh as well as, and then they burned the uh, storehouses in the region and two years after you know the uh, governmental army or, or the uh, you know imperial army marched to another port uh, town called yangzhou and massacred you know hundreds of persians and arabs in the region and these are well recorded and well explored and i am not going to the details but you know at least the chinese contemporary tang uh, official uh, records uh, you know uh, document uh, these episodes in the history and then it become even more solid once we come to the 9th and 10th centuries uh, on the uh, prominence of the islam and we have several of these you know geographical travel accounts uh, you know that is coming uh, from the period and you know, talking in detail about the presence of the muslim communities in the in the region and within that we have five major functional uh groups you know so of course now it becomes clear that you know muslims were important in the uh, in the indian ocean and who were they you know and what were their occupation or function in the uh, in the uh, region of course there were the traders but were they the only ones no so there were uh, the most important ones were the uh, refugees or the exiles who were running away from the religious persecution so again you know we cannot take islam as a monolithic of uh, element or monolithic religion there are multiple factions and you know they were fighting one against each other and some of them were you know uh, or many of them were uh, fleeing uh, from the middle east uh, you know to the indian ocean region and then we have evidences of the ibadis shi'is alawis and even some of the sunnis you know fleeing uh, the persecutions in the middle east in the in the uh, 7th 8th and 9th uh, centuries the 7th century case is the and the earliest muslim community themselves you know being refugees in the abyssinia and eventually like other denominations uh, the uh, ibali shi'i alawi and sunni communities just to give one peculiar instance there is this you know instance or the uh, you know evidences of the alawi community who uh, seek refuge on the korean peninsula or under the silla dynasty uh, in south you know in korea uh, as well as in the south uh, eastern coast of china and uh, and similarly uh, so this one uh, comes from uh, 9th century this particular reference comes from the 9th century and then the shirazis another group uh, mainly shi community but also not necessarily only them so the shirazis in the swahili community uh, swahili coast is a well known uh case of the refugees uh, you know escaping from the middle east and settling in the east african coast so exiles and refugees that is the one major group and then the second one the traders uh, and i am not going to the details of the traders but uh, one again like you know uh, in the context of korea uh, ibn khurad khuradad be he mentions to the you know uh, this is a 9th century account where he uh, talks about how the traders settled in the in the in the region because because you know it was very congenial uh, and environmentally and climatically very uh, and even politically very welcoming uh, to the muslims and they were far away from the their core religionists uh, from the middle east and another one is the soldiers uh, as i mentioned about the con- political conquest in sindh and then uh, you know uh, the hilak archipelago who had settled in the places uh, and then two other groups uh, one is that the scholars and uh, 
yeah so sorry scholars and preachers uh, so we have you know sort of like later uh, accounts uh, on the uh, uh, some of these scholars coming and uh, estab you know establishing themselves in the region such as like you know there is a this kissa chakravarti farma or you know kissa is the kissa you know or the story of the chakravarti perumal that is a arab uh, chronicle uh, or arab account Uh, maybe written in 13th or 14th century but claiming that you know islam uh, or the one of the combine companions or one of the close associates of the prophet had came to malabar and uh, stab and appointed 10 qadis in in different uh, areas of the region and similarly in the ming uh, sources uh, we have uh, ming sources and also a little bit earlier in the Uh, during the uh, mongol period in china also we have instances or evidences of you know one uncle of the prophet called sa'd bin abi waqas you know coming and settling in gangja uh, in china and you know still uh, the mosque dedicated to sa'd bin abi waqas is is you know existent in the region and there are some of these inscriptions from 13th and 14th century which claim that you know uh, which make the uh the same claim that the uncle of the prophet had came to china and then you know established there and so forth and uh gangjau or you know kandan which is like you know even more known in that english name and similarly from somalia there are these two tribes uh which claim their lineage from the two uh, scholars or the preachers who had come uh, to somalia and uh, you know married to the local community and then you know established two prominent tribes in the region and these are just uh, some examples of popular narratives uh, within the muslim community about the establishment of the uh, or about the tra- mobility of the scholars uh, in the in the in this first centuries but uh, we uh, you know should not take them again at their face value but uh, they uh, there are some uh, uh, instances such as this particular figure Ibn Wahab al Qurashi, uh, who had met, uh, managed to the, uh, managed to meet the Tang Emperor in the ninth century, and it is a historical uh, figure. And we do see, you know, uh, how uh, scholars like him uh, travel between the Middle East and uh, uh, and China uh, in the name of Islam or in the name of the Prophet. And then also in Sindh provinces, we uh, Sindh province, we know. several scholars of hadith uh, coming from the places like baghdad and settling in the 8th and 9th centuries and some of the muslim scholars from sindh also going to the middle east and these are again like you know unlike the first three instances the last two are uh, historically proven and we have contemporary sources uh, to uh, substantiate this circulation of scholars uh, in the in the region and finally there are the diplomats uh, and we have diplomats uh, traveling all over uh, 7th 8 9th and even 10th centuries you know uh, for on special duties and just to give one simple example is at bit in the uh, just within a 100 years between 650 and 750 750 the umayyad dynasty you know uh, had sent 33 mission to the tang uh, capital changan and uh, some of which even demanded that the tang should uh, submit themselves to the caliphate and before as well as after this there are even more diplomats who had traveled between different sorry different uh, kingdoms or polities within the regions so uh, uh, from that i'll come to the you know the avenues of the legal interactions were so once all these like you know major functional or occupational groups travel between the uh, areas what were the uh, venues uh, in which law was important and i'll quickly go through some of them one is that the political conquest right once you conquer the places then the questions of like you know the islamic legal questions of poll tax uh, that is uh, jizya it's called right which was uh, also practiced in the indian subcontinent uh, by the delhi sultanate as well as the mughal sultanate and so forth 
so the question uh, during the political contest the uh, and the very act of contest itself is a legal uh, question because it uh, relates to the question legal validity of jihad you know jihad is of course it has a lot of interpretations and a lot of controversial connotations and interpretation but uh, primarily it is a it is a or at least i would say it has a lot of legal implications and so uh, we do see that you know uh, the legal connotations of the political congress through the framework of jihad being discussed extensively between the political sorry the military commander uh, commanders or the army commanders in the uh, in the sindh as well as in dahla who negotiate uh, with the with their masters or their you know sultans and the governors in the middle east and then the administration once it comes to administration uh, different areas become uh, different areas of law become important and then the you know conversion again a legal question of course it's spiritual but also it comes along with the conversion like you know for example uh, you know uh, if you convert but not your brother or your wife uh, you know or if uh, if you if the children convert before the parents what are the you know connotations in terms of inheritance you know access to the property access to the maintenance and so forth so uh, these questions are also important uh, between these communities and another two uh, another one is the mosques establishment of worship places was an important uh, area in which uh, law was again important and then the intermarriages uh, with the uh, with the local community or the extra Uh, religious communities so uh, in the remaining time i'll briefly touch upon the last two so mosque and intermarriages so mosque which is basically a physical institution so uh, in the settlements we we have evidences of the muslims you know who had whether in china or africa uh, settling themselves along with the local communities as part of the uh, residential uh, zones or res- residential areas but also there were separate quarters uh, so in the sub- once you have a separate quarter for the foreigners such as china often maintain a separated a separate quarter for the foreigners so in all these occasions they did uh, have they did manage to establish uh, their own uh, uh, mosques and uh, in some like you know, especially if uh, the place is conquered through uh, political or through military uh, commands uh, many of the maintained many of the muslim communities maintained their own enclaves with uh, you know separating themselves from the uh, both muslim or oh, sorry uh, separating themselves from the subject uh, non muslim subject population so in in these instances also we do see uh, you know several archaeological evidences in which the uh, mosques were uh, established and uh, along with it also the instances uh, we have textual sources about the temporary worship places uh, being established like you know some of the travelers who travel to these places uh, talk about how you know the small muslim communities established uh, uh, temporary worship places and then the legal questions that are uh, that raise in this uh, context uh, is the issues of endowment that is the work of you know uh, as well as the property uh, ownership so can you endow a property that uh, is gifted to you or can a non muslim ruler endow a property to uh, to the establishment of the uh, mosque and also the administration in terms of like you know whether who has the authority uh, to appoint um, a qadi a, a muslim judge Uh, usually according to the traditional uh, islamic legal uh, framework it is the sultan who has the authority to appoint the uh, qadi so uh, all sort of those uh, questions uh, become evident and then another one uh, that is uh, evident in the sources in the 9th uh, and the 10th century is the question of naming the caliph uh, in the friday sermons so during the uh, khutbah or the during the friday congregational uh, Uh, sermons uh, you know the the naming the caliph was a important act of affiliating oneself with the uh, wider muslim world and people uh, you know, for example in the 9th century in 851 uh, 
uh, in the Akbar scene of Al-Hind, uh, one anonymous author says that in China, in Guangzhou, uh, the Muslims, you know, uh, in their Friday khutbah or in the Friday sermon, they name the Caliph in the uh, uh, every every Friday. So this was important. And so, uh, even some of the refugees who had, uh, 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 who had, you know, sorry, fled from the Middle East and uh, settled uh, in, in the present day Pakistan, despite of like, you know, their uh, exile, they were still naming the same Caliph. Uh, and we have again, evidences for that kind of thing. And uh, social institution marriage, which is, you know, very important uh, figure, sorry, one important dimension, especially for my current research project, which look at the matrilineal Muslim communities. And it sort of uh, tie into this large stereotype of the Indian Ocean itself as being a very patriarchal space, where, you know, uh, in the Indian Ocean, most of the people who were traveling were men and women were, you know, basically living, uh, were settled and not necessarily traveling. And this is not true, uh, but, uh, uh, given on the basis of the evidences that we have, uh, we do see many of the people who travel, like you know, whether men or women are traveling, uh, they themselves marrying, sorry, they marrying into the local communities. And this was one of the earliest evidences or earliest uh, forms of, you know, social uh, formation in the, in the region. And there were, you know, there are uh, uh, evidences of uh, exogamous marriages that is inter-religious and which is, you know, marrying outside the Muslim community or the Islamic community. And then the question of the temporary marriage, something called the mutra marriage. Uh, some of, you know, uh, many historians also has, have written about the, you know, institution of mutra or the temporary marriage as a, as a legal framework in which many of the Muslim communities had, uh, you know, married into the local community. But I doubt uh, the, you know, importance uh, or the importance of the mutra uh, in the marital relationship in the region because it is prohibited in, uh, in the Sunni schools of uh, Islamic law as well as in the Zaydi Islamic law, uh, Zaydi school of law. So I'll come to these uh, technical aspects if there, are, if there is an interest uh, eventually. So uh, in terms of conclusion, oh, what, what you should take away from uh, you know, this complicated story is basically one thing, uh, that there is the uh, uh, assumed or arguable doctrinal telesophobia. That is, you know, in the scriptures, people are afraid of, like you know, there is an argument that the people were afraid of the ocean. But uh, historically, once we look at the evidences or the historical practices, we see, uh, we do not see a thalassophobia, rather we see a thalassophilia, that is the love of ocean. So that is like, you know, from the seventh century to 10th century, that is something that we see. And a little bit uh, complicated, like, you know, not complicated, but, you know, something that if you would like to keep another thing uh, from this lecture is this Islam and its institutions functioned in most of these mad, uh, maritime zones in a constant negotiation with the non-Muslim polities and law was an important uh, realm. Intermarriages, conversions and propagations as an initial and intimated spectrum of infamiliarity uh, that, uh, you know, necessitated uh, discussions in law. And finally, as you can see in this whole uh, area, there's a triangle of the African, Arab and Asians engaging one, uh, you know, each other. So this is important. The last one is important because usually whoever writes the history of Islam within South Asia or Southeast Asia, they all or East Africa, they'll talk about you know Islam being sort of a unidirectional, like you know it is being imported from Arabia to the uh, to these regions, which is not at all true, and that is why I say I like we need to understand it uh, instead of a unidirectional process, we need to understand it as multidirectional in which the African community as well as the Arabs and, you know, Persians and, sorry, Asians and, uh, you know, Asians within Asia, there are several other 
community simultaneously uh, contributing and then you know contributing to the making historical and uh, human experience of islam yeah. i'll stop here thank you for your attention and i'll take uh, questions if there are any Thank you so much sir, for this amazing lecture, this very interesting lecture, because I think this is a very less talked about topic that you have today tried to explore. And we have some questions from the audience. And the first question, uh, I, I forgot the name of the person who asked it. It was, uh, apart from Tipu Sultan, which other Muslim ruler in India focused on the naval power and the trade on, on the Asia, oceanic trade? Okay, uh, good question. Uh, it is uh, like, you know, this is in the existing historiography of South Asia. Uh, many historians have argued uh, there was, uh, you know, sea was not important for the, you know, land-based polities. Uh, so the major um, uh, kingdoms such as, or the major dynasties such as the Mughals or the Delhi Sultanate and uh, even the previous ones, this is not true. Uh, like, you know, they, they say that they, they, were, they didn't have uh, much interest in the ocean. Uh, once we do look at the uh, textual sources, we do see that ocean was an important uh, element for, it may not be necessary, may not as important as the land-based, you know, agrarian economy, but still many of them had important, uh, you know, or many of them had important concerns about the oceanic, uh, what was happening in the ocean. And uh, so uh, the uh, Tipu Sultan is much uh, like you know, comparatively later uh, phenomenon. And there were several, like, you know, for example, in the Gujarat, of course, there are these major ones who had, once we look at the texts closely, you know, the primary sources, we do see instances of, you know, the ocean playing an important for the major empires. Uh, and for the minor empires or minor dynasties, uh, like, you know, for example, Gujarat, uh, it was very important. And uh, Jodi, Gulati, Balachandran have work on the, you know, Gujarat uh, Sultanate has proved, you know, the centrality of, you know, oceanic mobility uh, for the uh, Gujarat Sultanate. And uh, similarly, the uh, in the Deccan uh, Plateau, uh, many other Sultanates, uh, in Ahmednagar, Bijapur, you know, and you name it, like, you know, almost all these places and uh, they all, all had, you know, very much, they were very much concerned about the, what was happening on the ocean. And in the 16th century and 17th century, many of them negotiated with Portuguese, with, you know, Dutch uh, and so forth. Yeah. Thank you for answering that, sir. Another question is from Sadheen Sen and this question is, could you please talk a bit more on the eastern coast of India and Bangladesh as one of those eight zones during this period from the 7th and the 8th, 11th century CE? Okay, very important question. Uh, I think at this point, uh, like, you know, we do have uh, some instances or some references uh, to the, you know, the Chittagong area or the uh, Bay of Bengal, like the northern side of Bay of Bengal, so to speak. Uh, there, I can't like immediately relate with any uh, settlement or I can't think of any Muslim settlement uh, in the in the present day Bangladesh uh, region or, you know, even West, West Bengal region. What we do have is like, you know, slightly south. Uh, if we are talking about the Bay of Bengal, then like, you know, from places like, you know, let's say the Coromandel coast, uh, we do have inscriptions from uh, 9th century uh, where a local ruler giving a land grant, you know, for a Muslim community. And uh, this grant, I think, if I remember correctly, from 850, 850s, uh, Kogan, uh, Yusuf Kogan, he talks about this particular inscription. Uh, so in the eastern coast, uh, there are like a you know, little bit so, uh, southeast. We do have evidences, but northeast of or the uh, of the region, I don't, I can't think of any uh, particular evidence at this point. Yeah. So next question is from Professor T K V Subramaniam, and his question is: Could you please throw some light on the salient differences between Shafi and Hanafi traditions 
and which one of them was more popular yeah important question i would say it's like you know as my the whole phd dissertation was on this particular uh, shafi school of law uh, this is something that i always you know uh, explored but uh, and i have a lot of a lot to say about this particular question but i wouldn't uh, go to the details uh, in the interest of time i would only say that like there are uh, the shafi school of law is uh, at least uh from the uh, evidences the legal materials that are available to us uh, shafi school of law seems to be more oceanic friendly or ma more maritime friendly uh so in terms of the trade uh, uh going on to the ocean uh you know engaging uh, like you know or the regulations on the shipping you know shafi law is something that is uh, more accommodative of the uh, ocean uh, of the oceanic or maritime engagements i would say that you know if uh, professor is interested in this uh, particular aspect you know to read parts of my dissertation or the forthcoming book yeah you're mute yeah. so next question is from alakanda george and her question is when did the early arab islamic merchants came in contact with or started trading with europeans in the west can you please throw some light on the timeline okay so uh, what exactly is the uh, question is it about the arab islam or uh, ishan can you yeah so the question is when did the early arab islamic uh, merchants came in contact with or started trading with the europeans okay yeah so uh, this question this term is very important because you know the term arab uh, once we talk about 7th century or 8th century or even before is a little bit uh, problematic because you know the identity of arab you know arabia uh, is very fluid for that uh, particular uh, uh, time period so arabs uh, you know the identity of arabs is something that is made eventually or later on uh, you know once they managed to or once like you know people start to talk about the arab and ajam where people like you know the political context or political expansions are happening more but uh, this dimension or this nuance is very important because like you know, even before the rise of islam people in the like you know, what we could call the contemporary arabian peninsula or the you know contemporary middle east uh, they were uh, trading with the Uh, mediterranean world and i would say that like you know it never stopped you know so even before the rise of islam uh, people were coming uh, and trading with the arabs through the red sea mediterranean alexandria alexandria and then cairo nile delta red sea in the ocean so these were you know uh, the connecting points between the uh, european and the uh, you know so called arabian trade or arab trade and uh, during the uh, seventh uh, or after the rise of islam also it sort of continued and this is what uh, uh, christoph picard argues in the context of the uh, mediterranean trade uh, you know when the caliphate um, the first or the early caliphate sort of uh, tried to engage in trade with the with the region so it never stopped actually and even though we tried to make a huge outcry Uh, about the arrival of the portuguese in the uh, in the ocean from the post, uh, from the perspective of you know uh, southern europe or western europe it was a big uh, step but from the perspective of italy uh, or you know uh, venice you know it uh, it was never a big thing because it that contact had already or was already there from first century onward you know uh, where we have evidences of that of course there was like you know ups and downs during the you know decline of the roman empire the prominence of the byzantine empire and so forth so there were like you know some sort of interregna uh, now and then but uh, it had continued historically before and after the rise of islam So next question is from Jaya Ji Nair and her question is what is the significance of the 10th century vis-a-vis the Islamic rule against oceanic voyage 
Okay, so what happens by uh, 9th century is that, like, you know, the most important uh, dimension would be uh, the establishment of a lot of new political uh, entities, new kingdoms coming uh, into prominence, uh, both in the, like, you know, in the places like, let's say, East Africa, uh, the Mahzumi uh, dynasty coming and establishing themselves in the, uh, in the Somali in the Abyssinian region. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, in the in Indian subcontinent itself, we have the evidences of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Ghazni uh, rulers coming and then, you know, conquering the places. So once we talk about these, these kingdoms, we always focus on their early mobility only in terms of the, you know, ocean, sorry. Uh, overland connections, not much about, but once they were coming, they were also controlling over the uh, local mercantile community, maritime mercantile communities, like places like Sindh and so forth. And even like, you know, I was just yesterday, I was rereading Babur Nama, where he constantly talks about, uh, for example, you know, his dependence on the boat. Uh, and, you know, Babur and Babur Nama is just an example uh, of, you know, the dependence of these Muslim polities. So, uh, yeah, dependence of these Muslim polities on the oceanic engagement, uh, oceanic uh, facilities. Uh, so by the 10th century onward, we see like, you know, many new polities, many new kingdoms being established in many of these places, uh, unlike before. So earlier we had only like uh, Sindh and then the Hilak as two examples, but then in, in Shiraz, sorry, the East African coast, uh, not only the Maksumis, but even more, uh, dynasties coming and establishing themselves, as well as uh, in the Indian subcontinent and even Southeast Asia, we have some evidences. Yeah, this is the major. So, 10th century is a sort of, I would say, yeah, a, grad, uh, a gradual step into a further engagement or further boom in the oceanic engagement of the Muslims. Yeah. So, we'll take two more questions, sir. And uh... This question is from Robin Thomas. It's a long question. I'll, I'll just paraphrase that. He asked that, do you think the Ch Chiraman Juma Masjid in the Kodun Galur, Kerala was built during the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad itself? And additionally, can you suggest any book to study the early Muslim architecture in Kerala? Okay. Uh, good question. <laughs> it's very controversial, you know, even though, like, you know, for example, when Narendra Modi uh, went to meet the king of Saudi Arabia. He gave a replica of this particular mosque that the, the uh, uh, I forgot his name, but the student is asking. Uh, I believe he is a, a student, or he or she. Anyway, so the person is asking. Uh, so yeah, it is celebrated as the earliest mosque in India. But uh, from the perspective of student of history, we don't have any valid sources to substantiate that it was in fact established in the seventh century. There are some other evidences, or oh, so at least some arguments based on inscriptions for other mosques, uh, a little bit from the Northern, like North of Kodungalu, uh, uh, like Northern Kerala where people, uh, I'm still not sure, but there are arguments about the inscriptions on the establishment of the mosques in the seventh century. Uh, so, but, Specifically, the Kodungalur Mosque, we don't have any any evidences to say that it was uh, uh, established. Like at least we don't have evidences from seventh century to claim that it is established in the seventh century. And um, there is this particular text that I mentioned, uh, sort of a, a primary source called Kisset Shakravadi Farmat, uh, a text that was written possibly in the thirteenth century which basically talks about the migration of the Muslim community from, uh, sorry, the arrival of Islam to the Malabar coast, uh, from Arabia to, uh, to the Malabar coast. So this text, uh, if the person is interested, uh, is uh, translated and published in Jesho, uh, you know, this famous history journal, Journal of Economic and Social History of the Orient. So Margareti, Roxani Margareti, sorry. Yeah, 
Sri as well as another scholar, uh, Scott Kugle. Both of them have translated this text and might be worth uh, reading. And on the Malabar coast, there is another interesting work. Uh, although, you know, I have some reservations, uh, Edward, uh, it deals mainly with the period afterward from 12th century to uh, uh, 16th century. It's called Monsoon Islam by Sebastian Prane. But more than that, I, I would say something that even more interesting is uh, in the context of China uh, by one scholar called John Khafi. I believe that's how it's pronounced about the Muslim traders in, uh, in China from 750 to 750 to 1450. So that work, both these works came out um, comparatively recently and you know the person might find it interesting. Yeah. So we'll take one last question for the evening and this is from Lauren Michael and his question is, sir, can you please explain more about Omani traders on East African coast who created Swahili language and associated cultures? Wow, <laughs> it's a broad question, uh, you know, and there are scholars who have written extensively uh, on the Zanzibar Muscat connection. Uh, you know, including the latest works by Fahad Bishara and so forth. So on the Omani influence, we can see two particular uh, moments. One is that the pre, uh, the era before the political conquest. Uh, so the Omani Sultanate conquered, uh, conquered uh, the Swahili coast, uh, Zanzibar, and as well as eventually they extended, uh, expanded themselves to the uh, coastal East Africa. Uh, by the end of, uh, uh, by the 18th century. So by the end of 17th century, and then eventually by the 18th century, they become important in the, in the, in the place. So uh, after that, you know, the Omani Sultanate itself uh, shifted its capital from Muscat to Zanzibar, and then the Omani Sultanates were ruling from their region. So from that re period onward, we have extensive records on the importance of Oman, uh, Omani culture, Omani connections uh, between the Zanzibar uh, or Swahili coast. A, a lot, a lot. And uh, historians have written extensively uh, on this, uh, on this connection. Uh, but what is more interesting, uh, for example, like, you know, from a pre-modern perspective, uh, before the uh, Omani Sultanate uh, conquered and then established themselves in the uh, region, there are evidences of the, uh, you know, uh, obvious connections between uh, the migrations uh, from uh, the Omani coast uh, to East Africa. So again, there are several communities, including, you know, some of the early migrations of the Arab uh, Arabs from the uh, to East Africa, not only the Shirazi community, but also uh, several other communities were arguably uh, came from Oman, uh, Omani region as traders and as settlers, and then eventually being part of the uh, you know uh, region. And even in the smaller political entities, the tribal polities that were established in the region uh, had also. Uh, uh, roots going back to Oman. So Oman, Yemen, you know, again, like, you know, we have uh, several uh, overlaps in terms of the, you know, uh, historical polities that were established. But I must say that this is not my area of expertise. Several scholars have written extensively on this one. So, uh, you know, we were interested. If this person is interested, like, you know, check out some of the works like you know at least the bibliography of uh, one of the latest work uh, in the in the area by Fahad Bishara um, and others yeah thank you so much sir for giving your time to car one and for delivering this amazing lecture we have been trying to we tried to you know invite you in January last year but it wasn't possible at that time but thank you so much for doing this lecture it was truly an honor mm -hmm. to host you this evening and Tomorrow we have a special lecture, so those who wanted to attend can attend. At 5 p.m. IST, we have Professor Fazal Devji from Oxford University, and he's going to speak about the Ambedkar's politics, democracy without the nation. So thank you so much, everybody who joined us live this evening for today's lecture. This lecture will be available on our YouTube channel by tomorrow morning, probably. So do check that out, share it with your friends and family. Thank you so much, and don't forget to subscribe to Carwan.
Have a great evening.